Good morning, U.S. History students. Miss Hammond here again to wrap up Unit 4. Um, today is our last content day of Unit 4, and it is 5.3, the end of World War One. So, um, those of you at home, I'd like you to just brainstorm. Can you recall a time in which you chose to or had to compromise with someone? 5.3, this last segment of World War One here, is all about compromises. Um, how do we decide that the allies, how, how can we end this war? So, um, starting with the Russian Revolution played a big part in the end of the war. Um, so, Russia, remember, was a part of the Allies. The war had led to food shortages and major problems in Russia. So, millions of Russians had already been killed in World War I. The Russian army was made up of mostly the working class and peasants. Revolutionaries in Russia overthrew the empire. Tsar Nicholas II. Okay, so there's this revolution that occurred. So the communist Bolsheviks gained control of Russia after their empire was overthrown. So Vladimir Lenin negotiated a treaty with Germany and Russia decided to pull out of the war in the spring of 1918. And so thinking about the effect that this would have on the Allies, it's right around when the United States um, finally got into Europe. So if we take a look at this map that we talked about in the, the first section of Unit 4, Germany um, was, and the Central Powers were stuck here in the middle between the Eastern Front, Russia, the allies on this side of them, and then the Western Front over here in France. So if Russia were to pull out and withdraw their troops, which they did, Germany and the Central Powers would be able to completely focus on the Western Front in France, which would have been bad news for the Allies. So the treaty allowed Germany to concentrate all of its forces like I was just talking about in the West. However, the Allied forces had uh, contained Germany at that point, uh, the, and a revolution broke out in Austria-Hungary as well and the Ottomans, who are part of the Central Powers, surrender. So in the meantime, John J. Persing and the AEF were giving much needed assistance to France in that Western Front, um, and exhaustion and fatigue started to set in for Germany as they began to wear down from years of battle as well as limited supplies. Here are just some photos and visuals of the Russian Revolution. All right, so uh, World War I consequences continued, Germany surrenders. So Germany signed an armistice, which means a ceasefire ending the war at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918 is when Germany officially surrendered. Fun fact, that is why we have Veterans Day and we celebrate that as a nation on November 11th because that was the when Germany surrendered um, during the Great War. It also led, once Germany surrendered, to a dissolution of four empires. So those four empires basically dissolved um, and, and were no more. That was the Russian, German, Ottoman, and Austrian-Hungarian empires were um, no more. So uh, there were nine new European countries established after the ending of those four empires. Okay, those four empires broke up and then nine new European countries were established uh, in their place. There were peace meetings between the allied powers, uh, the big four. Okay, so the U.S., Great Britain, France, and Italy, they were considered the big four, and they met um, to decide kind of what was going to happen next. Germany was not invited, and we're going to talk about why that is important here in a bit. Here is a photo of the leaders of the big four pictured above. President Wilson there is that tall drink of water to the far right. So uh, Europe in 1914 there, pictured to the left. Okay, uh, Europe in 1914 
pictured here to our left, Europe in 1923 pictured to the right. Okay, so those old empires like we were just talking about became new countries. I'll let you take a look at that for a second. So President Wilson wants peace without victory. Okay? So he proposes a 14 point plan. And in those 14 points, he continues to say, there aren't going to be any winners, there aren't going to be any losers, but there's going to be a better world when it's all said and done. He also called for a League of Nations. Okay? Um, and what the League of Nations would do, it would be uh, many nations together agreeing to protect, respect, and peacefully settle disputes. So he wanted to create this League of Nations in the hopes that they would be able to meet up instead of going into a war to the magnitude of World War I. Uh, this is a graphic from your textbook if you'd like to take a look at the more specific 14 points. So the United States rejected the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles we're going to be talking about here in the next couple of slides. Um, and it, it was a treaty to help end World War I, like what was going to happen after the war was over. So the U.S. Congress ultimately votes no on the treaty. Uh, the American citizens were in a few different groups. The irreconcilables not to get involved in global politics and stay in isolation. Okay? They did not want the United States involved in global politics, stay in isolation. Uh, the reservations did not want to be dragged into another war. The Wilson Democrats supported the treaty um, and in support of the U.S. to be in the League of Nations. Ultimately, it was rejected by the United States. Uh, the United States rejected the Treaty of Versailles and Wilson's League of Nations. The League of Nations ultimately failed, but it laid the groundwork for the United Nations, what we have today. So those are the groups we were just talking about, these American citizens, the irreconcilables, reservationists, and then Wilson Democrats. So the reservationists were more in the middle um, on the topic. So the Treaty of Versailles, this is a video clip here from history.com. It's fantastic. I would highly suggest that you uh, take a look at it. But the Treaty of Versailles forced Germany to take the blame for the war and pay $33 billion in reparations, okay, which is another word for uh, to, to describe the payment for destruction of the war. The treaty also stripped Germany of their military and it forced the uh, boundaries to be redrawn and created Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. All right, um, so headlines read, Wilson leaves Paris, sails Sunday, Germans pledge to act in good faith. Treaty signed, war is over. There are some political cartoons we'll take a look at, um, looking at some foreshadowing into to, to World War II um, here in a bit. So World War I consequences continued. The inflated wartime economy returned to normal. Okay, so in 5.2, we looked at what was going on at home, who were taking the jobs um, of the men who were enlisted and overseas. So soldiers returned and they were looking for work. They came back from the war and they wanted to work. Uh, wages decreased and many strikes broke out. So when all of these strikes were breaking out following the war, uh, many believed and feared that this would lead to a communist excuse me, revolution. And that is where the Red Scare comes into effect. And so communism, we've discussed before, is equal or classless political structure. Um, and the Red Scare was the fear of communism spreading in the United States. So capital is, that capitalism would ultimately lead to a class struggle um, and revolution. All right. So that wraps up 5.3. Uh, there's a lot that happened in the last four days of Unit 4, the World War I. Um, as always, if you have any questions, please uh, email your teachers. Make sure you're going along with your textbook as well. I hope you have a great day.